Okay, cool. Right, so yeah. welcome everyone to another edition of Candy Talk Podcast. Um, I'm Bane, and with me is Mondu. Um, and today we have a guest, Bankole Ojo. Um, Bankole is a friend of mine. I've known him for over 20 years now. Uh, as I, I was just saying before we started recording that, you know, it's kind of, he's been my friend since around when Abacha died. So anytime you think about Abacha's death, it's kind of like an and for just death anniversary is kind of like an, an anniversary of our friendship. Um, but more than that, he's, um, he's an established architect in Abuja. Um, and he is um, also into woodworks and other forms of architecture as well. Um, so welcome, Bankale, um, and welcome, Mondiu, as well. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks, Bani. Thanks, thanks, thanks. So today we're just going to be talking with um, Bankole on his experiences and his, his views and thoughts on vocational education. Um, although he's an architect, um, he's been in the woodwork space for some, for many, for you know, a number of years now. And as such, I feel that he's an authority and he, he is someone that can speak to what vocational education is and what it means to Nigeria in today's reality. Um, so first of all, um, Bankole, can I just ask, um, why did you go, I mean, we've, you know, architecture is kind of like the, you know, talking about us Nigerians, you know how we don't like to, we like to do the finer, finer things, you know, the more, we're, big, we're, we're snobs. We like we like classism. Right? <laughs> so I want to ask. Uh, my first question is that why why did you decide to go into woodwork? You know, you were you started as an architect as an architect from Mina. We were putting Mina together, and so why why did you decide to go into woodwork? Why woodwork? Well, like with most things, you, you will you would look at a few there were a few things that came together to make that happen. One was probably opportunity. Uh, the second part was necessity. Um, and somewhere along the line, you know, for, for, for the purpose of motivation, you actually have to love what you do on some level. You yeah. know? So um, the opportunity was that my older brother came, my older, my older brother was based in Ireland. I was trying to set up a business in Nigeria. Um, he was told, you know how you know, you know how Nigerians sell business to you. They're like, ah, that door they sell for Nigeria now. I get one guy. We in those times they make door angels. Other, you know, they'll just hype, 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 hype. He was using he was using motorcycle. That is now the Range Rover. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know that's how they give you business plan in Nigeria. Like ah, pick it. So he came. He set up. Uh, it was. Uh, he set up and he was running it for a while, but the partner he had, uh, he started suspecting that the partner he had wasn't exactly um, remitting, you know, the usual uh, partnership problems and all that. Yeah. So he came to Nigeria, um, asked me to come along for a few of his inspections to the site and so on. And then when he was done, in the end, he was like, okay, you know what? Um, he wasn't happy with what he saw. Yeah. He was like, okay, could I run, could I run the factory for a few, <clears throat> for a few months, about six months, and then let's see how it goes. So, um, I did, and I quickly found out that it was profitable. I found out I was a good business to be in. I found out there was a high demand. Um, and but like I tell people that when people ask me, Oh, how did you get into carpentry? I'll be like, It's Boko Haram, it's Boko Haram that cost it. And uh, when they say why or how, it was, I think at the time, this was like 20, uh, I might be, I think 2013 or 2014. After one of the attacks, my brother just called me around 6 30 in the morning, was like, Look, I'm not doing it again. I'm not like wait a minute, like, you said six months while looking at, like, really good profit. Why are you, like, no, that he's not doing, 
that Nigeria is very unsafe, that you just watch CNN. I'm like, no, like it's not as bad as it looks. We're like, no, it's not. So anyway, we at the point I was like, okay, do you want it? So we struck a deal and then I took over the business. So that was kind of the opportunity part of it. The other part of it was like, oh, the necessity of it, which was um I I can tell for a while in Nigeria has been struggling. Um, there's really not much upward mobility for you as an architect. Like if you're working in, first of all, a lot of architecture firms don't pay well. Then the few that pay well, like there's really not, there's not to, you can't really go too far unless you break out on your own. And then, so but at that point in time, I'd kind of been struggling with, not kind of, I had been struggling with architecture a lot, like, you know, and one of the things I saw a lot was we would not once, not twice, uh, we would run a project, we would um we would run the project, I'd pay the electrician, I'd pay the carpenter, I'd pay the mason, and then the clients won't pay me. Not once, not twice. There was one the guy who like we finished the project, I didn't hear from the guy, I was like I was calling him, he wasn't picking up and everything. And then I was not like, ah, okay, let me even go and check the house. Yeah. I always went, got there, saw hanging clothes outside, curtains in the windows. What? <laughs> my, my guy had moved into the house like fully, you know, without letting me know and everything. Wow. So, like, there had always, and a lot of architects would give you those stories. Like, um, I, I feel like in Nigeria, we really do not respect knowledge work. We really don't. We don't respect it. Like, is it not just. If it's not tangible. Yes, if it's not tangible, there's very little respect for it. So, like, oh, I'll draw you a plan. So they'll be like, oh, I can just go to, there's this place in Abuja called Sky Memorial where people print a lot. You know, I'll just go to Sky Memorial and I'll just pay this to, to get this done. So um, a lot of architects are struggling with that. Um, in Nigeria, and it's actually there's, there's a there's a rethinking the architect's role worldwide. It's a worldwide reckoning, to be fair. Um, okay. But in Nigeria, it's quite acute. Um, oh, so, so, so that was the ne- so I'll just yeah. So I was sorry. sorry I, 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 there's something that you just touched on that I, I felt is important to clarify. So you're saying that actually what's going on in Nigeria, although it's happening at an acute and faster rate, is actually a global uh, global trend as well. Yes, there's a global trend of it, the engineering sector has kind of been up, have, have they've been upping their game. Like, okay. you know, before the engineering guys were just the, they were the brawn to the architect's brain. But the brawn has been getting smarter. And what happens when the brawn gets smarter? They are also better at executing, period. Like, you guys are, are, are kind of like just the academic, the, the thinking. But these guys, they do the thinking and they also have the ability to execute. So it's kind of, been the engineers are kind of been creeping into the architectural space for years now. So there's this whole conversation about that. So so in Nigeria though, you know, it's moving at a faster pace. So there's that. Um so at that point I was just like, look, I know that I pay the guys who work under me, I pay them. They call me or guy on site, they call me our boss on site, but I'm the least paid Person, and I know how much I was paying these guys to get the job done. So when the opportunity came for me to like, okay, um, um, become a carpenter, I'm like, okay, why not? My brother came along, needed some way to run his thing. Um, I wanted to, I also wanted to see whether I could find a new set of skills to yield, uh, to, to start making some money for myself. Um, and that was really, really, so that was really how uh, I got into it. And also there was a whole, uh, uh, strategically, you know, sometimes you want to be big fish in the pond. Um, a lot of, a lot of the, uh, the copy base here, is a lot of vocational skills. You have people who are taught informally. Um, some people who can't read, who can't write. Um, so I'm like, okay, I have that. I have my ability, I'm trained as an architect, I can design, I can, I have project management skills, 
So it's just a matter of now applying that to this space. So even for the first few years, I not not yet, maybe like a year and a half or so, I really didn't want to tell people that I was an architect. I just wanted to do the job and leave. But as people found out that I was an architect, then they started insisting, you know, started making more demands of my design experience or my project management experience to to add to whatever I was doing. You know, the first couple, I just came to make your sofa. Or the next thing, it's like, okay, so what do you think of this space? How can I use this space any better? Blah, 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 blah. Can you design something that can, uh, that can work for me and so on and so forth? So it actually now, I can even, it now opened up more of an opportunity for me in that sexual space. Kind of like, uh, you kind of see why the, en- why the engineering professions have kind of, have kind of, um, yeah. gained as much ground as they have because that's kind of the path that now opened up my 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 experience that my opportunities as an architect so so yeah so that's basically that's basically how i got into it um i'm still but still doing it can't complain like it, it, it wow. did me well wow so so essentially what you've done is you've you've done it the other you've you've moved the other way you've um you know, from an architect, you've gone into, <laughs> you've kind of like branched out into um, more, well, carpentry is, is some kind of engineering, isn't it? You could call it wood engineering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can call it wood engineering. Yeah. <laughs> you, we can call it wood engineering to make it, you know, make it sound yeah. nice, you know. Um, right, so that, that's, wow, that's, I didn't even know, I, I actually, honestly, genuinely didn't know about the whole architectural, you know, the, the trends globally and stuff like that. Um, I, I've actually always wondered about it, to be honest, because I remember when I remember when I was in um, school, I think I had a conversation with one of our, you know him, you know, uh, one of our colleagues who was an architect as well, who used to say then that apparently there was there was this one of the world's most renowned designers who wasn't an architect. I've forgotten the name now, and I wondered, I wondered where whether with all the with all the advancements we've made in technology and how easy it is to design, whether yeah. I kind of yeah. I wondered about it, but I didn't really know that it was you know. Okay. The way it, it, it's, it's really huge, and like you know, there are two ways you react to it. Like a lot of times, I don't like to go for the architect meeting because they turn into a wine or something. Oh, you know the good old days. I like hey, look, man. And oh, there was this uh, there was this conference I went for a few years ago. Uh, this lady came to speak. She wasn't even an actor, and I really liked the idea of the conference. The idea of the conference was to bring people outside of the architectural space to come and speak to architects. Yeah. So kind of like, and she came in. She was a graphic designer, and she was just like, "Look, you guys are not a gated community anymore. Like, your the knowledge that you guys are." are Riding has now been democratized. So you're going it's to decentralized. have to about what you do. Yeah. You know, so, and, and I still see that, you know, like, so you have to provide a lot more value. Like, you have to provide a lot more value. And that was what, um, and you're right, like, it's funny how it was through, because I was in the architectural space, I wasn't seeing these things. But once I now got into carpentry, I now started seeing the limitations of our profession as architects. That look, you, it's the market. You have to give the market what it wants. Like people don't, because a lot of architects come like, oh, I want to just draw and give it to you. Go and sort yourself out. Right. And a lot of Nigerians are like, why would I come to the architect? He will now give me they have to go and start looking for somebody else. Why don't I just go straight to the engineer? And this is a real conversation. This is a very real conversation where the uh, a client will come to you and be like, look, uh, you'll come to an engineer. They'll now be like, Don't you have any plan in your house that I can just use for this my plot? Like, like that that's real. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's real. Like, oh, don't have any, just copy and paste. It's a three bedroom now. So this thing, I yeah, you do know, standard plot, just copy and paste. It was you as the actor, you're now coming like, no, you need to, you need to, you need to. So it's kind of like, look, I'm not bothered. I'll, and this is, you know, Nigerians, we like it simple. And I'll be like, I get 10 million. And the engineer will be like, okay, I can do it. And he will do it. You know, like, 
design is not it's not the design is not ambitious nobody is trying to is trying to pull up any trees in terms of innovation or anything so yeah um oh. i just feel like there, there was there's a response there was we i think we're still we're still reeling and not ready to come to terms with it, with the changes so but let's see how it goes so talking about talking about the fact that you know seg you know basically just segueing a, a way to reason why we're actually having this conversation really because it's not about <laughs> it's an architectural conversation as much as i love the i used to admire you guys when you guys you know you sit down in your house and all that actually, so. yeah go, go go um so i would say that so from your experience so far right so you've been you said that you started this since 2000 and, 13 or thereabouts, right? You've been into carpentry. So have you, because we're talking about vocational education now, all the people that have worked for you, did you, did any of them have any sort of vocational qualification? Or does any of them have any, do you come across anyone? Wow. No one. So since you've been- oh, Well, uh, one of my like, one of my electricians, one of my electricians, he went to a vocational school in Nasarawa. Um, he went to a vocational school in Nasarawa. Um, but carpenters, no. At best, what you would get is maybe um, a company is bringing in some new products. Okay. And, and some people would, and they would come and train a few people on how to use these products. So I have a plumber that's done that. I have um, an electrician that has done that. Um, even, well, this is, it, well, it doesn't work for me, but my mechanic too was part of, was one of, was part of that program. So that you see. Then these guys, uh, Pujo in, in, in Kaduna. Yeah. Have, have been very, very good with that. They are automobile, the automobile factory in Katna. They've been very, very, like anybody will tell you, like, no, well, I don't know the number, but a lot of people actually take their cars to Kaduna to fix, rather than let them, rather than fix them in Abuja. Well, wow. there's this really good program that was, it ran about, it ran about, uh, I think six years ago, for a while. So they were training, they were training people. Um, they, they, they partnered with the Nigerian, with the Kaduna State Government. I think it was under, this was under McCarthy. The first, it was inaugurated under McCarthy. I can't remember the name of the program, but they trained a lot of mechanics. And those mechanics, they moved, they come to Abuja. Some of them set up in Abuja. A lot of them still stayed in Kaduna. But you just find that if anybody will tell you, you really want a good job done on your car, take it to Kaduna. Whether you're in uh, Abuja, whether you're in Joss, whether you're in Lokoja, take it to Kaduna. So it's mainly been, it's mainly been, it, there hasn't been any real support from the government schools. It's really been private uh, businesses, private, the private sector building out, uh, building out programs that teach, and they are quite specific. So maybe it would be, oh, there are these, there's this new line of of pipes and accessories that are going to be used in plumbing that are better than what we've used before. Okay, we're going to train a few guys in this. And from there, those guys kind of like take the, they learn that and then take it forward into and share it with the rest of their boys. And that's kind of how the, the, um, the knowledge gets passed down. But there's really no, wow. there's no real, there's no real structure. Yeah, there's no real structure. Because the, the, so you know the, so the reason so the reason why I asked that right the reason why I asked this and Monji you can if you have any questions you can just let me know just tap and let me know yeah um, yeah yeah no no worries carry on cool so the reason why I asked this actually is because I wanted to I wanted to see if from your experience there was a difference between you know the trained the formally trained um, people you had working for you especially as carpenters as against the people who just probably land on the job you know i'm just trying to test out a theory in my head about because okay, <laughs> okay. There's a, it would work specifically there's another bifurcation there which is you have 
you have what they call like the factory carpenters. Okay. So these are the guys that work for the big for the big companies, for the big furniture companies. Then you have the other carpenters, let's call them the street carpenters. Yeah. Those are the most common, those are the ones that you find around. So and uh, what I found is that there's actually a big gap between those two. Not necessarily a good one. <laughs> it's not necessarily, you would expect that the factory capitals would be better. But the factory capitals are really, they work with the big machine. They are used to working within a structure. Once they are taken out of that structure, they struggle. In other words, they don't know how to use their initiative. They can't think around corners. They really struggle. They don't have the, they don't have the industrial grade machines to work with. They don't have uh, you know they specialized and all that. So meanwhile, like for all you want to complain about with the street carpenters is they will always find a way to get things done. Like the, the way they would use a plank of wood to do things that you do with um, with a proper with a proper bridge and a rack or a jig in, in the wall in a factory in an industrial grade workshop. You would be shocked. Like they just find the way to, they just find the way to get things done because they really can't afford to get more. So they really can't afford to get tools. They really can't afford to get uh, the the high high grade high grade equipment. They need to get stuff done. So they just find these really innovative ways to get things done. So one thing I quickly found out was, you know, a lot of times I did this course at the time, like when I was when I was running the my brother's workshop. I did this course at the time where uh, I think it was set up by USAID on carpentry. And you know, like there's a different language in the market. There's a different language in the market, different processes, like everything is different. So I came with my theory and I just found quickly that, bruh, sit back and watch these guys. Watch these guys. Because in the end, you also have to look at this. We are talking 10,000 hours. These guys are putting in their 10,000. Mm. No, they are working, they are working, they are turning over work. Like so, are doing things quickly. Now, there's also the point in which bad habits get entrenched because of, you know, bad habits get entrenched. But, you know, at, but at the same time, there's so much to learn from them. It's just that it's really not codified. It hasn't been, they don't write these things down. There's no, yeah, it's not being captured video nothing you know it's just you 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 get it there still the apprentice system you know one woman will bring her son and be like well yeah i just have to make it sit on here or make it online work and the way they even teach it's not like the most effective way of teaching they'll just be like well yeah just sit on there they look <laughs> or something you know or you know like it the knowledge is not being passed properly so yeah like there was for the longest time there was a it was a huge period of learning for me. I first came in a bit honestly arrogant about like, yeah, 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 I'm going to smash this. But there was just a gap between the things I wanted to do and the way it was being executed. Different language, like I said, like it's a different world. So that bifurcation between the, the factory carpenters tend to work within the more formal, and even then, a lot of the carpen a lot of the factories here are run by the Lebanese. Okay. So they are not like anybody will tell you that it's, uh, they aren't the some of the factories here, the stories that come out of it with the way they treat their people, they are not quite ready to share the information. It's not like they are they are quite happy to share the information and so on. So um so yeah, so basically, like it's that that the that there's a huge difference between those two, the factory guys, the street guys. There's a huge learning curve between both of them. Wow. So I'm just um this this is really I I'm just there's something that you said right that really struck me. You said when you finished your course from US aid, USID, you or US well USA. And what you yeah. <laughs> USA, USA, USAID, USAID, whichever, yeah. USAID yeah, whichever way. When you finished your course there, you said you wanted to bring in that course 
you wanted to bring your knowledge, your theory, your theoretical knowledge, and you found out quickly that it wasn't working. That kind of like jumps at me because that's what I'm saying in essence is that does that mean then that vocational education shouldn't happen in your experience? Are you saying that we shouldn't try? I guess you kind of answered this question in a bit towards the end of your explanation, but I'm still gonna I'm still gonna ask it. So from your experience, are you saying that? vocational education should would improve the current state because if there's already like a culture a, a different world of informally trained people right and they're 100 100 percent like yeah ah you've got to be around up now like look here's the thing right like what the quickest way i don't know it, I, I'm, I'm probably influenced by the routes that are coming through. Which yeah. is, you know, but I've been, you get, I've, I've, I've been an architect and tried to do the knowledge, but, and then I've done this. And first of all, here's why I see. I feel like our young people take too long to become economically viable, uh, middle class anyway. Like, you go to primary school, then you go to secondary school, then you go to university and you don't know when you finish. By the time you're coming out of university, that means you are not economically viable until you are in, at best, your early 20s, or if not mid-20s, late 20s. You know, like I went to Mina now, I had uh, two extra years. I came out, I got out of school at 27. I got out of school at 27. I got an extra year because one lecturer was upset with me that I was doing a part-time job at, was it Celtel at the time or Airtel? I can't remember what their name was, whatever. One of their name changes. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was facility manager for the office. In, I remember them. In what they call it. <laughs> yeah, and like the regional manager was showing up for an inspection. I had to run there and make sure everything was in place. While I was there, I missed the guy's test. So I now went back and went to beg him that, look, well, I missed your test, so I'm sorry, blah, 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 blah. He asked me why. In my naivete, I thought that if I tell him that, look, oh, while I was doing this my extra year, it's not as if I'm being idle and trying to do work. I now told him that, ah, that I went to do, I went to the office to do my work and work. And the guy was like, oh, so I think that what they are doing in class is not important enough. He's not giving me the test and I'm failing his course. So I stayed another extra year. So like, you know, a lot of our youth are stretched out. They, they this guy like, before you start becoming economically viable, it's too long. And meanwhile, when I now enter this space, I'm seeing 13-year-old boys supporting their family. You know? They are supporting their family, 14, 15 years, 16 years old. They are guys that, look, they've already built their houses at 22, 23. It's not, it's not going to be the best house. But you're working with your hands and you're pulling in the money. So yeah, there might be another discussion about, uh, about financial mm -hmm. education and how to use the money that is coming in. That's another, that's another thing, but the money is coming in. And for me, with the amount keeping about, oh, Nigeria has a huge youth population, it's a liability if they are not economical. There's a boy that lives around my house, I think. I already see him. He's probably, I don't know, he's probably in the first one or the two or something. Like, and I see him single parent household. And I see the frustration and the energy that he still has to spend. He's still a dependent, you know, like, and I see it and I'm like, ah, like this would, and it's, but he's not, even, the way it works is that he, our culture is, he's not even going to, especially the, our, our arrogant, what is that something? That's, what's that thing that somebody said on, on Twitter that I think we have the most arrogant, we have the, we have the most the poorest. Oh, he's the best. He's the best in Nigeria. 
is the person that said for for a country that is as poor as Nigeria, we do really have classism and stuff like that. That was a tweet around. Like, 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 and it's it's it, it's so crazy. Like uh, another thing was that we were I was, when I was I was really looking into containers container housing as as um, we have a housing deficit. As of 2015, we need to we needed to build like a million houses a year. I don't even know where they got that figure out because I think it's small. But like we needed to build a million houses a year for the next 20 years to catch up with our housing deficit. It's, I'm sure it's a lot worse now. But, and we're like, oh, you know, containers could really solve that. But you see Nigerians be like me live in a container for what? You know, like, and you don't have a house. So <laughs> like, say with vocational skills, like they're like, look, you guys, you're, you're struggling to pay these kids school fees. You're struggling to feed. You're struggling to, but you don't want your child to do certain things. It's not a logical conversation. It's an elitist conversation. Yeah, and I face that sometimes. Like, I, I do face it this year where, like, a client, the client's wife was really like, look, you're a carpenter. You can't. You can't, you can't even stand in the same place with me. Me, like this. Like, <laughs> like, it's crazy. And I'm like, it's crazy. So I'm like, these things could solve your problems. Like, and you have um, the North, especially. Okay, one of the things that happened, I don't know that we'll get into that later, but one of the things that happened last year was I got a two-day a two day notice. After the coronavirus, like after the lockdown, sorry, not after the coronavirus, after the lockdown, people were leaving, like the government started demolishing markets all over Abuja. I don't think this ever, it didn't, I don't think it registered on Twitter. It didn't register on the news. I personally believe that this was one of the major drivers of the banditry we're seeing in the North, the drastic rise. Um, one of the things was I saw the security report from Cardinal. So, um, if you start as of last month, um, last year, I think there were about a thousand, well, let me just take a figure, about a thousand kidnappings last year in Kaduna. As of the first three months of this year, they had already hit 800. And after the lockdown last year, what happened was, I can remember after the lockdown, the first day I went out to check my workshop, I got back. The next day, I went out to go and arrange some things. As I was coming back, I saw big bulldozers smashing markets. And I was like, these were furniture hmm. markets. Like I think that I registered on Twitter. I think I remember seeing that because there was oh, one particular yeah. lady that was wailing and, you know, she's a mechanic. Oh. Yes, I remember that. Now, it wasn't, it wasn't one market. It was, there were about like six markets that I know of that were being smashed. Um, there was this guy near my own workshop who had about 11 million naira worth of glass inventory that got smashed. They smashed it, just destroyed it. We, the furniture market guys, they gave us two days to clear out. Now, here's the thing. I have my main guys that work for me. Then you have these other guys that kind of just hang around. Like, they just hang around. They'll help you clean up. They'll help you cut grass. They'll help you go and get diesel from the, from the, uh, from the filling station. You know, they'll just do bits. Of, they'll help you load and upload things from your, well, you know, when you're loading to go and deliver furniture, they'll come, they'll give them whatever. They'll load it up. You guys now come give us two days to clear out. Me, I'm fine. I got a new place in like 30 minutes. I'm fine. But here's the thing. These guys were already, it's not like, like I, I'm never saying it with any judgment. Like these are guys that were already sniffing glue, smoking, whatever. But they had kind of made the decision that, okay, maybe, maybe for this, because they believe in God or something, that they will be law abiding citizens. And you come and take all that away from them. And they have cousins. 
they have brothers in the village that are being economically viable by kidnapping our middle class and rich people. What do you think is happening? What are you incentivizing? Us that were giving them vocational skills, that us that were giving them a place to do, like there's this guy, uh, my security guard at the workshop at the time, he would pick up crap, all the pieces of wood that were cut, were cut into pieces on the ground. He would knock them together and make these ugly, ugly ass stools. But he was selling them one 1,000 naira. Cost of material, zero. He was using our tools in the shop. Cost of equipment for him, zero. And I was paying him at the end of every month. And he was, he's fine. We now have to leave. What does he do? So, like, for me, within vocational skills just makes sense in the sense that it's the quickest bang for your buck. In two months, three months, I can turn a young man to start into something that is earning money to at least feed himself. Mm. To at least feed himself. I, even if it's that, oh, look, okay, we're going to do this job. Oh, yeah, come along for the installation. I'll pay you so, 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 so per day. He's valuable. Right now, a lot of people are not. They're just walking around doing very low-level things. That, and there's a lot of demand. We're bringing in what they call it. Uh, Tylers and upholsters from Togo. I'm mm. bringing them in from Togo. Togo to come and do what? It's even a sign of this. Like ah, uh, sorry, I've even done it too. So let me not be hypocritical about it. I'll be like ah, no, 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 my upholster is from Togo. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? You, don't, you don't want to be like Trump, China, 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 <laughs> and the hat is made in China. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, let me go, let me go to you. But you know, I'm like, ah, you know, uh, we even, and the client is like, oh, wow, your post is from the go, okay, fine, 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 let's, let's do this. So, but for me, the biggest bang for your buck, get these people, because there's work that needs to be done. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Carpentry is big business. Yeah. Tiling is big business. All these things are big business. It's just, well, you keep, you smashed market. Why are you smashing market after, you told us to sit down at home for two months or was it three months one of my welders called me at the time i was like look bro i have four kids he's not going home he was refusing to go home for days because you knew that the government was not going to provide any palliatives or any support yeah so So, like (laughs) so these guys these guys can work with their hands you now told them to sit down sit down at home don't walk yeah, so uh, how is that How is that going to work then? If and then they start working and then you not demolish where they work. You know, it's, yeah. just, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's breathtaking, really. I don't even know what to call it. I don't know whether to call it callousness or it's just, it's just pure incompetence, really. It's just, I don't... I, don't... Uh, Bani, Bani, I, think, I think it's worse than that. I think it's, uh, I think it's a mental... I think, that, I think that issue is mental. I think it has to do with the... The, the, the way the 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 um the framework of the government like if you get into the government now it's 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 almost cultural like this is how you think so this is how you interact with the civilian population you understand so you don't feel just like how you see during slavery during slavery uh, there was this book that i read that they they uh talk about how you dehumanize people to a certain extent that it now gives you the uh, the courage to now carry out those dastardly acts because you because you don't then f- your conscience doesn't hold you to ransom anymore so yeah. your your conscience no longer becomes a stumbling block so that's why you can predict a pandemic coming in in fact you are in a pandemic and you already know that the government doesn't have the, the existing resources to take care of these people if they ask them to go home so practically it is impossible to feed themselves you understand so you are dealing with a possible case of uh, um people not being able to eat <laughs> and that is going to be an economic disaster you understand so that that is upon you as a government and your role as a government is uh, uh to maximize mm-hmm. 
the welfare of the people. That is the only thing you are meant to be doing. But you are the, you are now the same people going to destroy people's welfare. <laughs> welfare. You understand? Like the, the only economic value they have, you are going after it. To, so to tell you that it goes be so if if you can change the psyche because it goes beyond just being callous or wicked or it's a mental thing and yeah. it, you yeah. know just like how the police a guy that can a guy that is struggling and he's, he can't feed his family and he's tired of the country and he believes that the country is not just and they give him the opportunity to go and brutalize some Nigerians and he's happy to go and brutalize Nigerians he's not even thinking that look. I'm I'm actually a victim of this system too. You just you there's, can't there's, do it. There's this thing, um, like you know, his la uh, the president's last uh, Buhari's last uh, interview, and this probably jumped out to me because I felt like it affected it affected me um, when he said that young people. Um, how did he put it? He was like young people that young people wanted jobs, but there were no jobs at the federal level, at the state level, yeah. and at the local government level. And, and so he couldn't give them jobs. And I'm like, why do you think he are the one supposed to give them jobs? It goes to that thing you were saying about that that comment shocked me. Frame of through which like it shocked me. Like it, I was like, this guy doesn't have the framework to understand you don't give us jobs. Just Provide the freedom, you know, just provide the environment. We're fine. All we're asking for is security. And, and you know, what, one of the things is, in this my whole journey now in vocational skills, almost every time that the government has been involved, it's been detrimental. This, this workshop that they demolished last year, is my yeah. second workshop getting demolished. The other time, there was this timber shed in Day Day. Day Day, Day Day, you guys, I don't know. You know the videos I make. I'm actually planning to make one of the Day Day International Market. Day Day, the Day Day International Market is an economic juggernaut in terms of like the amount of economic activity in that place. But the roads are terrible, electricity is crap, everything. But still, there's this guy, uh, Baba Ahmed. If you lived in Abuja, I would be like, the chances of you walking through a door frame that he has supplied is probably very high. But what does he have? He has this shed with his 1976 Mortis machine that he uses, and he's cranking out these things, and he's making money. Anyway, so these guys came. The timber shed, they are like, look, they are demolishing the timber shed that on the Abuja master plan, there's a road that is supposed to pass here. This was 2017. Till now, that road hasn't, the market has been destroyed. That road hasn't materialized. And that place is currently a rubbish dump. Like rubbish dump, as far as your eye can see. Yeah. So, so <laughs> like, there's this, there was something a, a friend asked me once, and I was like, this is so true. It's like, but you, if you showed up in Nigeria now, and you said, I am going to provide 5 million young people with jobs that will drag them out of poverty into economic prosperity, you might be dead in a year. Like, like and I'm like, why is that? It's because these people see, they won't see you as providing economic prosperity to their people. They will see you as rivalry to the government because the government is supposed to provide economic prosperity to people, not you. Nobody from the private sector is supposed to do that. So, like, it's a huge, huge problem in the way they look at things. Because why do you keep attacking? We, we, there's this, uh, there's this uh, project that we work on. Uh, I create skills. What we're doing in 2019, the coronavirus really put it in it that one. But like, we were running competitions all around the country to find the best, to find the best vocational skills 
Igbo. So we did it in Kaduna, we did it in Enugu, we did it in Lagos, we did it in Abuja. And it was in about, in across like 19 skills. So carpentry, tiling, um, electrical work, uh, automotive, automotive mechanics, uh, shoemaking, tailoring, um, tailoring, welding, plumbing, everything. And consistently, consistently, our biggest problem was the government. We had good support from companies like Bosch, from Raifeng, from Devolve, from uh, Peugeot. The private sector was in. Was in. So, and part of the thing is that our approach was this, right? We also understand the fact that whether we like it or not, our middle class is our literati. Whatever the middle class will find cool, the rest of the nation will probably follow. Look at Uba. It's basically Kabu Kabu. Can you imagine before Uber came to Nigeria, if we said, oh yeah, you that you just finished as a, as a graduate, come and be driving Kabu Kabu around Abuja, like the way they would look at you. But Uber kind of came in and made it cooler. And I live in Abuja, so one of the things I noticed was even the other taxi guys now upgraded their game. So that was kind of like what we we're looking at, like, okay, fine. How do we find new competitions? That we did this competition around the corner. Let's, let's find these guys because a lot of our winners ended up being graduates. So the guy who won tiling was <laughs> graduated in economics from uh, what they call it. I think one southern university. The guy who won carpentry graduated from the University of Agriculture in Ocean State or so. And like, so I like okay these guys they will be able to first of all they will be able to make it look cooler. They'll be able to make the middle class buy it. And they will be able to upgrade the level of the work, like upgrade the level of the work, upgrade the way people look at the work. And then maybe people will be able to buy in. Because look, it's with, I find it really ridiculous that you would have the number of people that gather around DSTV offices every year to try and make it in for Big Brother. Where, what is the probability of that? What, one in, I don't know, what, what's the figure for that? One in, one million, let's just put it at that, for you to actually make the money from Big Brother, as opposed to this thing that will, within, if, I can't I say don't, You don't have to wait to be if you are in an apprenticeship. Sorry, back to the yeah, you don't have to win to be empowered. And immediately you are paid. You are getting paid. And like, you can't come and be an apprentice in somebody's shop. And you will, at least you won't be able to have transport and food. It's not possible. Nobody does that. Like even amongst the carpentry community, they'll be like, ah, that your organo they try for you. You mean say no give you money, go out. You mean say no give you money, chop. You're getting, I know it's not much, but at least you're getting even, you're paying money. It's so ridiculous. Like you're paying money, you're paying a lot of people are complaining about how El Rufa increased the, the school fees for the universities in, in, in Kaduna, you are paying money to get an education that doesn't prepare you for the workplace. Mm. Yeah, and I, then, you know, guys here that are giving you money, like, it's not much, but it's better than this other, this other bet that you are yeah. making. This is not a good bet. And actually, right now, I have a question we on that. need people like you, like, No, sorry. No, finish. Finish your thoughts. Yeah, I'm listening. Okay, so you just talked about... No, I'm done. I'm just like, I, I'm just frustrated at my young community. Yeah. Okay, so you just talked about the um, educational system and how it takes too long to train a Nigerian to be ready for... In fact, there, there are two, two issues there. Even when we train right now, I think back in the days we used to train well now we have quality issues in training we don't really train well but even with that it takes too long to train an average nigerian to be ready to you know come work for you for instance if you if you had the um vacancies so and also we we the way you talked about the uh the street carpenters how 
they they are very streetwise and they they have a lot of like you know creative ways of solving problems and they are always ready to fix issues uh, but they don't have that formal education most of them don't have that formal vocational education but apparently that sector that informal sector as i like to call it it appears to be the market share of the industry it's the that's the core of the industry but we now we've talked about the struggles of the government how every time they come in is always to destroy or to take or to extract from you not to support now how do you how would you solve that problem of you know bridging that gap between the the space or the time it takes to become ready to how can we formalize i want to add to this question yeah you answer it all as one how can it's like something I actually wanted to ask. Thank you for bringing this up, by the way, I'm on you. Yeah, yeah. Something I actually wanted to ask. How can we formalize what we have now? Exactly. You know the current, this current, this current system that informal that we have. Yeah. I'm yeah. thinking there's value there that is being trapped. How yeah. can we take that and say, okay, let's formalize this. Okay, this is what's happening. This is what this guy does. This is what this guy does. Let's kind of like okay, that's the standard, and let's yeah. kind of formalize it ish. So yeah, that's added to Mondu's question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, um, <laughs> like, I don't know, there is a lot of academics in this country, but I would get the academics in. I feel like there's, there's that, and for good reason, security and so on, like the middle class is kind of siloed off from, from this, like, I, I, I tell people that there are layers of Nigeria. A lot of us that were on Twitter and social media were, were, not, were not the real Nigeria. But the Nigeria the world knows, but we're actually a minority. So, we're not the real Nigeria. They are system. And it's arrogant to not realize that for this country to not have evolved into anarchy, there must be some sort of system that are in place because that's the only reason. There's, a, there's an alternative, whether it's banking system, whether it's training system, whether it's what the only thing that the only issue that we're having here is that it's not, it's not being recorded. It's not written down. It's being passed down uh, vocally, uh, you know, just mouth to mouth, uh, word of mouth. That's, what, that's what's happening. Nobody's writing anything down. I actually insist, like every new guy that comes to work with me, I'm like, don't show up for a meeting without a pen and a pad. They'll be like, I oh, know, I gotta get on for head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. Mm. And at the, so that, so like, people can't read and write. So a lot of the information, and like, one of the, my master carpenter, I'm actually, it's just, Nigeria is stressed. Like, so you, there are things that are important, but because you are dealing with so many urgent things, you can't now settle down and deal with the important things. Like, my master carpenter is one of the most knowledgeable people on natural wood. Uh, no, not one of the most. He's the most knowledgeable person on natural wood I have met. There might be other people for me that I've met. He's the most, not, he's the most knowledgeable person on it. Nothing written. And I've been thinking, look, he's like, 55 now and like how if he goes god forbid but if he goes all that knowledge goes away so there's that nobody's capturing the knowledge that is here the second part of it is like we have the issue of um understandably like these a, a lot of our academics probably don't want to mix in these spaces because it's not safe for you. You know, um, one of the issues, especially now, one of the issues that I've been having now is from last year after the lockdown, is my guys actually tell me to try and come to the workshop less often. Because if I come, they see my car, they see me. It makes the workshop a target. So there's stuff like that. So like you have the academics, the people that can actually come in and codify these things. Like, there's a, 
you are, you are worried about, people are worried about entering the space. Now you're going to get the guy that can actually do the proper research from his office in the university to come and sit down in the market for months on end. Who is even sponsoring the research? Who is all this? So there's the security issue, there's the sponsorship, who is going to even, like, so me, I'm just, I would, what would I do? I would get people in to codify a lot of the knowledge we have. And it's good knowledge. Like it's because these guys get stuff done like yeah. it's it's amazing. It's practical. Practical knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Like what do you call it? Well, in our first competition in Abuja, the guy who won came in from Abelkuta. We brought in one of the trainers. The, so Bosch gave us the tool that the competitors are going to use to work. And then the, they sent in a trainer from Morocco to come and train the competitors on how to use tools in time for the competition. By the time the competition started, the guy from Abelkuta started setting up jigs to make sure his work went faster. I had to tell the trainer from Morocco, please, can you speak to this competitor after? You are actually distracting him from his work while the guy was competing. Because the guy was so tripped how this guy was setting up his workspace to achieve what he needed to achieve. He was like, how are you? Oh, you're doing this so that you can cut your board straight. You're doing this so that you can uh, make your mitas. You're doing this. Like, the, he was tripped. This was the guy that they sent to train them. So it, there's so much knowledge here that is not being captured. That is not being captured. And we'll just keep losing it. So for me, what would I do? First things first is, okay, and another thing is, um, so first things first, like I said, um, it's not being codified. I would really love to get, uh, I'd really love to get uh, research that academics in to come and codify everything. Put it in writing. Let's put it in writing. Um, there was something else I wanted to say that just kept my mind. Uh, what what what, what role do you think what role do you think the government will play in this? I mean, we've talked about the frustrations. But Bankole, Bankole, this is this is absolutely insane because we want to talk about possible solutions to one of the most critical industries in the country, and we have to think about bypassing the government. Like we have to be forced to not think about. Government it's intervention, madness. absolute but, but, madness. Let me, let me tell you, let me tell you the story. Let me tell you guys the story, right? For the competition we were doing, we were working with vocational schools and colleges, so they would provide us any con any state we could find. We would try and get them to be the judges, or you know, to come up with the projects for what our competitors would do. There was one state. Let me be PC about it and not name the state. But there was one state <laughs> that they actually sent us. <laughs> they sent us. A, they sent us contestants. Then they sent us fake judges. The school, though, they sent us fake judges so that the fake judge would make sure their contestants won so that they would get the prize money. That's what we were dealing with. Another vocational school in another state came and actually stole the prizes. The judge came and like, I don't understand. Okay, yes, you have authority in your college. You now came and exercised the authority at the competition while we weren't there, like we were off doing other stuff. So like after the competition, all the, this was for the makeup artist. I think... Uh, uh, no, 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 this one was in House of Tarot. But one of the sponsors now gave back to all the contestants, whether you won or not. This woman seized everything and took it away. And we are calling her and she refused to pick up her phone. This is from the government side. So, like, here's, well, here's the other side of it. Like, um, in Enugu, I'm not 
yet involved in the project at this point. But what we're doing is the the government is actually there's this really amazing guy. I'm trying to remember his name. He's the commissioner for SME in Enugu. So let me give him his props. He's been ready to work with us in the sense that he's actually paying private people to take on um, apprentices. So we get for the for the number of apprentices you take, we'll give you, we'll pay you. Okay. And then every every three months, for every three months, we give you what they call it. We come and test the apprentices to make sure that they are learning things. Like, you know the good thing with vocational skills is that you can't win. You either know it or you don't. You know, you can't write the answers on your arm. <laughs> you can either make the word or you can't. So that is still early days. Let's see how that goes. Um, the first few months have been extremely promising. But yes. Yeah, to your point is that look, it, it, uh, it's a, the government can be a really powerful force for good. Our experience is that it hasn't. So that's why I'm very like, look, and it's not even that it just hasn't done its job. Every time they've gotten involved, it's really been disruptive, like extremely disruptive. And so we're like, look, if that's the case, <laughs> another story. One of the guys I work with went to speak on vocational skills in Germany, I think Germany. And he, he was there with the government official. He was there with the government official. And he was, this was in 2019, before the lockdown. Like I said, the lockdown really threw stuff off, but like the momentum was really good at that point. So Bosch was there, the Walt was there, all the top power two companies were the guys organizing this conference. And what they are, they are here's the thing, they are looking to create a market in Nigeria. Not out of the goodness of their heart, but so that they can sell their stuff. Like if you have a lot of uh, artisans here who can use power tools. That means what? You have a higher demand. So they are looking to sell their stuff. So anyway, so uh, the government uh, official comes up to give his presentation. And they are basically showing the CEOs of Bosch and DeWalt dilapidated toilets in their state. And quote, unquote, one of the, one of the government functionaries said, so you don't have to pay for everything. You can just pick one one toilet to renovate, and you know we'll be very thankful. Oh, oh man, I, I don't know. So, how do how do they? How... Um, the guy that we're working on this whole initiative together comes up. <laughs> so, but it goes back to that thing we said about framework. They don't look at the, the, the way they look at what Mondio said earlier. On. Like, yeah. They are not trying to empower. They are mm -hmm. not trying to empower their people. That's not the aim. You know? And so my other guy comes, gives the presentation about all the stuff we've been doing, all the competition, all everything and all that. And there was that Q&A &A after. It was a very testy Q&A. Because as far as the government functionaries were concerned, my guy had come to embarrass them. They couldn't see past that. And I watched the video and I told him something. I was like, he was, he was feeling a bit bad and worried. He was feeling a bit bad and worried. And look, it's going to become a problem for him when he gets back. From the and I was like, for the dynamic I saw on the video, all those CEOs are not CEOs because they are stupid. They would see that the government is your problem. And it showed. After that, when they were having, well, after the whole event, the CEO of Festo, Festo came, was, so the guy, my guy went to talk to the government officer, you know, like, was trying to like, you know, I'm not your enemy. I'm your friend, type of like, try to 
calm things down a bit. And the CEO of Festo didn't exactly help when he walked up to both of them while they were talking. He didn't know what they were talking about, but he just walked up to them and he's like, you know, you have to make sure that he's on, that the project he was talking to the government, he was a government minister. He was like, that project that I was supposed to work with, work on, or work on with you guys, he has to be part of it. He has to be part of it. Make it happen. Then he walks away. And my guy's like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you get like, that is the relationship we have with a lot of government officials. Like, we were trying to get one of them to come over for our event one of the final of the competition in Lagos. Yeah. Like, they loaded us with a bill. Flight ticket, hotel, everything. Not support, they gave us a bill. Yeah. I, yeah, it's, it's... You know what? It's, yeah, you, it's, it's very consistent. I, know, I don't blame you for not wanting government involved. Yeah, it's... it's yeah, a, of course. It's a, it's a drawdown. It's a drawdown. So, um... Right. I mean, we can sit down here and talk for forever, but man, this has been, this has been. Yeah. Okay. No, let me not. Let me not be too. Now, here's the thing. I actually. So, what I actually think is, let's see how the Enugu project turns out. Let's see how the Enugu experiment turns out. Right. I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic. What we hope for is that. It actually, because here's what we're also proposing to the Enugu government, which is you guys are going to now have cheaper labor to execute your project. Like if you have a government project, these guys that you have trained, you can now contract them to execute your project. And what that makes you more money. So let's see. Uh, my One of my reservations is the fact that as usual, with the top things in Nigeria, I'm not looking at it as a government, like a lot of the good things that are happening in Enugu, government thing. I'm looking at it more as it's the personality. The guy, I, I'll try and get his name. I know his first name is Arinde, um, Commissioner of SME, I think Commissioner of SME in, in this. So, like, what happens when he leaves? That's my reservation. Like, he's been amazing. He's been amazing. But what happens when he leaves? But what we're looking at is that if that works, it's a system that we want to replicate in other states and see, okay, let's, I know Oshun kind of, they were making a few positive noises. Let's see how it goes. So the government can be a very powerful force for good. Oh, they can. But in the meantime, for us, yeah. So, but for us, what the way we're approaching it is a private sector, from a private sector point of view is young people are not, we made the economic case. We've seen people make the economic case over the years, but it's not it's not captivating to young people. Big Brother is more captivating. Being the next week's quiz kid is more captivating, especially to let the lower middle, upper middle class. So what we are doing is we're trying as much as possible. Like these guys that won the competition, we get them designers, get them dressed, you know, like put them up on billboards, like give them startups. Let's come at it from that point of view. Give them status. Because what we're looking for is people to want to do this. Mm. The economic case is clear. But they have to want to do it. There have been many vocational skill programs that have failed. They failed and failed and failed again. Because the people just won't show up. They don't find it interesting. They don't, they don't see... like it's, And what you find is that... So that's why you find a lot of the people who are involved at the least. They don't have, it, they didn't have any other choice. We want the people that have a choice to choose this. Mm-hmm. And you have to make it look cool. That's why, you know, like I try, there, there, was, there were these guys who had to do a reality TV show and so on and so forth. Like there's this t- there are these t-shirts that I make. Like I'm like, look, it's packaging. You can make it look cool. And I can remember when I walked in for the meeting, I was like, oh, yes, that's what we want a capital to look like. Cool. Fine. You know, like, you know, like we want um, one of the trainings that I was setting up for for some guys in the vocational space was it wasn't stuff like how to make a box, how to make a miter, how to put a pot joint together. Mm. Yeah. It was how to do social media to sell your stuff, how to take good pictures of your phone. 
furniture, um, how to dress professionally. Let them look. The knowledge is there, but there's a perception problem. There's a there's a once again goes back to that thing. Our being the most arrogant poor people <laughs> in Africa. So like there's that perception thing. So it's that thing where if that's how I look at it. That if we can deal with that, if we can make people want to do this, it happens. It happened with. Um, it happened with. There have been areas like it happened with music. It happened with music, entertainment. You can remember now, like during our day, we, we would hesitate to tell people that ah, we used to rap or yeah. we used to sing. Now you can say why because the people have seen on TV that there's something to it, you know. So I believe a lot of times uh, there's this thing, there's this way that sometimes you can make a mistake of thinking too much like experts and get like stuck in the weeds, whereas you need to come out, take like a really, a macro view of it. What we, what I would say is that if I could, I would mount a huge media operation to change the perception of people towards this. Because I truly believe that I want, once the middle class buys into it, once they buy into it, it will just organically happen. It will organically happen. Any other thing, it would happen in bits and bobs and in, there will be pockets of success in different places. But once the middle class says, oh, this is what I think can happen, this is what I've seen can happen, and they will make it look cool. They will. They just will. Right now, there's already a lot of movement in it. I'm already seeing, especially like a lot of young people, like, um, I don't know whether, there's this guy, Josh, he's on Instagram. He makes these fans that are kind of like, like statement pieces. I've seen one in Don Jazzy's house and everything. He designs them like simple stuff. But these guys are social, are, are, are very savvy with social media. And well, that's what people are going to see. They will come there. It's not, oh, this thing is going to drag you. Like it just, I don't know. It just doesn't sink in. It's going to drag you out of poverty into economic prosperity. It just doesn't sink in. But ah, this guy, he they make fun. You can get 50,000 followers. Let me go start to make fun too. That, yes. Not logical, but I don't know. That's what I've seen. No, you're 100% facts. Right. Wow. This, this, has been, this has been quite... You definitely have to come back again, Banky. Um, you have to come back again. Um, but yeah. Um, have you got any other questions? No, um, I still got loads of questions. I have, I have, I, yeah, I have a lot of questions, but I think uh, we've we've actually um, we've actually done a good job with like um, the core talking whoa, whoa, about whoa. the core exactly, yeah. But there's a lot to talk about still. Uh, when Bankoli has the time again, he can come and grace us with his uh, with his presence. Bankoli will definitely bring you back on the show, definitely. Um, and um, I just wanted to. Yeah, in closing, I usually I, I usually want to ask, well, I've not been doing it as frequently as, as I should, but I usually want to ask this question. You're the president of Nigeria today. What is the one thing? Now, a lot of times you hear presidents come with seven plan agenda, eight, 15 plan surrender, whatever it is. Just do one, give us light. <laughs> what, is the one, what is the one thing? You're president today, Banky. Uh, Bankole, what is the one thing you're doing? What is the one thing that you are, you can only do one major thing? What is the one policy thrust of your government? Uh, I, here's what I think. I think, I think in Nigeria, I think we have like a discussion issue where we are working frameworks that don't apply, like we're working with frameworks that don't work for us. Yeah. So what I would do is to order a, a study, an exhaustive study on the best way to incentivize Nigeria and then take it from there. Once I sort that out, like, okay, what makes Nigerians do what they do? We spoke now about status. Status is a huge thing. I don't, I don't think it's factored into a lot of things. 
we are proud. We are like we. I was, I was speaking with uh, a friend of mine who's Zimbabwe. Yeah, Zimbabwe, and she was just like, man. I was like, okay, fine. No level with me. What do you think about Nigeria? And she was like, man, you guys. Uh, that we look at you guys like you guys are just arrogant. Like you guys just you believe your government, and I don't feel like that factored into how we think about our issues. You know, most of the time we just think about it economically. We just think about it. Uh, we just think about it like, oh, how will you benefit? And I like I was, it's just a quick aside. Like, uh, so how Jack tweeted that guy on Bitcoin. Yeah. The Nigerian guy who wrote an open letter to Buhari. I don't. This was just this morning or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read that. He, he, the guy wrote an open letter about that, and Jack tweeted, <laughs> Jack tweeted his letter, and I told my wife that Jack just buried this guy. Like <laughs> the guy that deleted Buhari tweet is recommending <laughs> something. <laughs> it's, like, it's not happening. Forget whatever economic dead. is. It's dead on arrival. <laughs> You know, so I'm like, so for me, that's the first thing, like, so that we can start building, like, one of the theories I have is, I don't think monthly salaries work with Nigeria, we short term. So, telling people to do their job for money that they might or might not get, knowing that we don't pay salaries regularly, but for, for money that they might or might not get in 28 to 30 days time. Maybe so for me it's just if I was president, the first thing I would do and assuming that I'm going to be left to be president for the rest of the four years is find out like okay, what exactly is driving us and then everything else comes after that. So that would be my that makes that a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense to me. It makes a lot of sense. So on that note, we are going to um end this conversation. As I say, we would like to have Bankley back. I want to thank you, Bankley, for coming. I don't take your your time for granted at all. We don't take it for granted. Um, we know how busy it is in Nigeria. And um, Mondi also, I know you're a busy man as well, you know, but... No, as... Oh, no, I'm busy, so, but I want to thank you. Not as busy as Bankley. Uh, no, 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 not <laughs> as busy as well. Especially in Nigeria. Nigeria, Nigeria exactly. stress adds about 30% to your busyness. Exactly. <laughs> And Bane, do you know do you know what I like? I like when we speak to business owners because they go through the struggle. They can tell you exactly no, what is. I tell going I, I tell all my friends that are business owners in Nigeria. I tell them I think I've told Bank it is. Yeah, I, they I, are I, heroes. They are miracle workers. They are, they are heroes. They're working heroes. on water. <laughs> heroes, you know. They're working on water. So thank you so much, Michael, for your time. I um, really appreciate it. And um, um, uh, that's about it from us. From, yeah, you're welcome, mate. That's about it from me, Bane, um, and you. All right, guys. Thank you. All right, bye. Thanks. Yeah. Cheers, mate.